everybody and welcome to super science saturday if you're just joining us welcome maybe some of you have been participating already in some of our science experiments and demos that we've been doing this morning um, but now we have a very special guest i know that some people are joining us from all over the country and perhaps the world today um, so you might not be familiar with him, but this is usually a local in-person event, Super Science Saturday, and we're in Boulder, Colorado, and we are delighted today to have Mike Nelson, who is the Chief Meteorologist for Denver's Channel 7, and he's joining us today to talk to us a little bit about weather and climate, and then he's got a really special treat at the end of his presentation. And Mike, I just wanted you to see today, just for you, I'm wearing my special cloud earrings because we're uh, talking about weather, right? Right. <laughs> I love it. Cumulus cloud earrings. Beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> Tiffany, thank you so much. And uh, hello, everybody. I'm Mike Nelson. I'm the chief meteorologist at Channel 7 in Denver, which is the ABC affiliate. And I've been in uh, Denver for the last 30 years doing weather. And during that time, I have, uh, in non-COVID times, typically spoken to two or three schools a week and just doing the back of the envelope calculation uh, over that time, I've talked about a million kids. And many of those kids from the early 90s are now moms and dads. Maybe you're watching right now. So hello again. Nice to see you all. So what we're going to do today is uh, kind of take a trip back in time. I want to show you what computer weather is today compared to how TV weather started way back when I was a kid, because um, for many of us, the local TV weather forecaster is as close to a scientist as most people get, and you invite us into your living room. So I think it's appropriate that we talk about that science, talk a little bit of a primer about Colorado's weather, and talk about climate change, and then we'll finish up with my special treat. So I'm going to try and share my screen here. We're going to get going on the presentation. Are we good? Everybody seeing that out there? If, if we're not, Tiffany, let me know, but give me a nod. Are we good, Tiffany? It looks good. All right. All right. Very good. So if anybody would like to contact me, uh, these are my various things. My email is mike.nelson at the denverchannel.com. Uh, Facebook and Twitter you see there as well. So let's take a little trip back in time, shall we? All right. Why is my thing not moving here? Okay. Hello. This one? Is my PowerPoint not PowerPointing? There we go. Okay. All right. So uh, I'm talking about some of the early pioneers in TV weather. And if you're watching from around the country, some of these names might be familiar to you. Uh, Don Kent, uh, then he's using a chalkboard there, was one of the first TV meteorologists. And he started in Massachusetts area in Boston. And I believe we have our little AMS seals that we show on TV around the country. He might be AMS seal number one. Harry Volkman, was a weather forecaster first in Oklahoma City and for many decades in Chicago. Wonderful gentleman. And Harry actually issued the first tornado warning ever on television. Back in the 1950s, the networks thought it would incite fear and panic if we mentioned the word tornado. Well, Harry was working in Oklahoma City and there was a tornado and he went on TV and issued the actual tornado warning. In the lower left, George Winterling was on the air in Jacksonville, Florida for decades. And in the late 1960s actually had animated weather maps where the fronts would move across the screen and he did it using film animation. He had a map that was set on a table uh, flat and a camera shooting straight down on it and he would move the uh, fronts just a slight fraction of an inch and take a picture, kind of like those old claymation animations. It would take him hours to make a cold front move across the country, but as long as 50 years ago, we actually had animated weather maps courtesy of George Winterling. And for the young ladies out there, Marsha Yaki was the first television meteorologist. Uh, in the 1950s and 60s, there were many uh, women that were on TV doing weather, but they didn't have any professional training. She was actually a National Weather Service meteorologist in Evansville, Indiana, and she became so popular that uh, they just let her talk as long as she wanted. And sometimes the sports guy would get upset because he wanted to give the baseball scores. And Marsha was still talking about the weather and she would just right in the middle of her show say, hey, sports, keep it up and you get nothing. Some other early pioneers. And if you've watched the movie Twister, you've seen Gary England uh, in that 
movie. He was the, the top meteorologist down in Oklahoma City for many, many years. Roy Leap, way back in the 1970s and 80s, had weather computers, great big mainframes down in uh, Tampa, Florida. And he had a staff of a dozen meteorologists. He made all of the rest of us very jealous. Bob Ryan was uh, on the Today Show for many, many years. And then he was at WRC in Washington. And uh, Harold Taft was legendary weathercaster down in Dallas. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of the Atlantic Weatherman, but back in the 1960s, Atlantic Richfield Oil Company would sponsor the weather on one TV station in any particular market. It was a big deal to have the Atlantic Weatherman on your TV station. And in Denver, we actually had an Atlantic Weatherman. He was a dear friend of mine, Bill Custer. Some of you may remember Bill. He worked over at Channel 9 in the 1980s and early 90s. And uh, Bill uh, was a just a wonderful gentleman, and he developed something called the Custer Kids, which were little characters that would tell you what the weather was going to be the next day. And the one that you see there is N. Clement Weather. He also had Barrymetric and Augusta Wind and Icy Roads. And moms and dads back then would tune in to see which Custer Kid was going to be on TV so they knew how to dress their children the next day. Well, fast forward today, my colleague Lisa Hidalgo in the morning always shows the weather emoji. So I guess what's old is new again. In Denver in the 1960s, we had a guy named Weatherman Bowman, and he would hand draw the entire weather map. And uh, that's how we would show it on TV is before we had computers or any of the other fancy stuff. And he, look at the detail. He has palm trees and a blue spruce and rivers and all kinds of things on there. Well, he would autograph them and give them away to his viewers. And a few years ago, somebody called me one day at the TV station. They said they were cleaning out their attic and they found rolled up in a tube an old Weatherman Bowman map and asked if I'd like to have it. And of course, I have that map pr displayed proudly in my home. So here's weather through the decades. Uh, we used chalkboards and magic markers back in the 1950s. In the 1960s, there was something called weather in the weather, where the weather forecast would actually stand behind a glass map and write backwards. And in this case, Blatt's was the brewing company in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and they sponsored the weather report. Uh, I stuck Brick Tamlin in there just for fun in the 1970s, but that's about how it all looked. That's me in the 1980s, and then we fast forward to the weather computers that we use today. Now, like many of you, I've been a weather nut since I was a little kid. I had a weather station I built in my backyard in Madison, Wisconsin, and I would keep track of the weather every single day dating way back to the 1960s, and I still do that today. So I went to the University of Wisconsin at Madison to get my degree in meteorology, and that's my first weather cast taken uh, in my major professor's office. When I was about 18, I began to work at a weather company in Madison called Weather Central, and we did all kinds of forecasting for TV stations, radio stations. We did the forecast that helped them build the Trans-Alaska Pipeline. Uh, we forecast for power utilities and ski resorts. And we developed many, many years ago, one of the first TV weather computer systems. This was my first real show on TV in 1979. It was in color, but we didn't have a color TV. So my college roommate just snapped that picture off the TV. And this is how my shows looked many, many years ago. This was before we actually had the weather computers and we had to draw the maps by hand. And uh, it took a long time to make these little pieces of artwork. We'd spend hours and hours creating these. And this is what it looked like using uh, plastic lettering and cut out uh, uh, film that we could create the color bands on there for precipitation. We could make a forecast. And I can tell you, I spent many, many hours sitting at the drafting table making these maps that we'd then stick up on the wall with some masking tape. And I would stand up there and do the weather. Well, it's time for a change. And this was the very first television weather computer system in 1979. That's me. And in the foreground, that is my longtime friend, Terry Kelly, who was the president of Weather Central. And we developed a weather computer on an Apple II home computer system. Very crude by today's standards, but it was revolutionary in the 1970s. And we began to sell these around the country to other TV stations. You could buy a complete television weather computer system for a little under $16,000. And it was so inexpensive, the TV stations didn't think it would work, so they weren't buying them. So we just did nothing else but double the price, and we began to sell them like crazy. 
So this is what it looked like back in the day. This was the earliest of the television weather models, and it kind of looks like an early video game compared to what we use now. But uh, this is what uh, we would do the weather with. And uh, you can also see the fashions have changed a little bit. So just to give you a little background on how these computers have changed over the years, we had in 1979 a computer that had eight colors that you could show. By 1981, we had a system that had a 10 megabyte hard drive that was about the size of a bread box or a, a home printer that you might have in your mom or dad's office. And we thought that was an amazing thing. We could store 10 million bytes of information into something that small. By 1983, we had sold over 300 systems. And by the late 80s, we basically had graphics that looked pretty much like they do today. And my job was to go out and train people on how to use them. And so I actually installed and trained the first computer that Al Roker ever had long before he ended up on the Today Show. I trained Gary Englund, uh, Paul Douglas in Minneapolis, and Bruce Schweigler, Harry Volkman in Chicago, and George Winterling was very glad to get a computer where he didn't have to use that uh, film camera anymore. Harry Wappler in Seattle, and even the legendary Stormy Rotman here in Denver. And this is what it looks like today, at least pre-COVID when we were still all in the studio. So we've seen some amazing changes over 40 years in television, or even 60 if you want to go that far. Let's talk a little bit about Colorado weather, which is such a neat state. That's why we love weather here, because on the same day, we can sometimes have a tornado on the eastern plains and a snowstorm up in the mountains. So here's where our storms tend to come from. Uh, the Alberta Clipper is a low pressure system, aka that big red L on the weather map, that zips out of southern Canada or the Alberta province. It tends to go north of Colorado. We don't get a lot out of those storms, except a lot of wind usually. Colorado hookers are those L's that form down over the Texas Panhandle or Southeast Colorado, and they tend to give us a lot of snow. And then Pacific fronts tend to blast in from the Pacific Ocean, and most of the snow is caught by the mountains because, of course, as the air pushes over the mountains, it rises, it releases its snow or rain, and then the air sinks on the other side. And of course, what happens then is we can get strong winds over the mountains. We can have cold air up in the mountain valleys, but as that air warms up, as it descends down into Denver and Boulder, that's when we get the Chinook winds and it can be 60 degrees along the front range and snowing like crazy in the mountains and very, very cold up around Fraser or Gunnison. Now, if we have easterly winds, that pulls the moisture in from the east and we get all of our snow along the front range. And very often in the mountains, it'll be sunny. So even if it's snowing in Denver or Boulder or Fort Collins, it could be sunny on the other side of the Continental Divide. People often wonder, where am I? In Colorado, these are the different areas that we talk about. The Cheyenne Ridge, the Palmer Divide, and the Raton Ridge are east to west, little higher elevations. If you ever go over the Palmer Divide or Monument Hill, that's what you're going over right there. And that causes a lot of differences in which areas get snow or thunderstorms. Uh, the mountain ranges, as you see, and then San Luis Valley and the Grand Mesa. So these are all different areas that we talk about. Thunderstorm season, one thing that you can watch for is how the storms are shaped. If they're fuzzy looking cumulus clouds, uh, that generally the updraft isn't as strong. If they're crisp and look like a cauliflower, those are strong updrafts, give you some severe storms. So this is what the updrafts and downdrafts do. The hot air rises, the cool air sinks. If you get vertical wind shear at higher elevations, you start to make that storm spin. And if that storm starts to spin, then you have a supercell thunderstorm. You can form a wall cloud, a lowering of the base of that cloud. That's where the funnel cloud would come out of. And of course, it's not a tornado until that touches the ground. Very important, the funnel cloud and a tornado are technically two different things. So here's a classic shot from a friend of mine, Roger Hill, who's one of the world's greatest storm chasers of a thunderstorm with the wall cloud and the tornado. And this is, uh, most of our tornadoes occur on the Eastern Plains, 90% of them east of I-25. And a lot of them over some open territory. So although we get a lot of tornadoes, I like to call it natural crop rotation because they're, they're not actually hitting except spinning around a lot of crops. But we can get bad tornadoes closer to I-25. The Windsor tornado back in May of 2008 was a, an EF3 tornado that moved 
from southeast to northwest, which is unusual, and it occurred in the late morning, which is very rare in Colorado, and it did cause one fatality, and most of our tornadoes do not cause tornado fatalities in Colorado, but they can. It's also caused $125 million in damage. When we issue warnings on TV, we don't issue them for a whole county. We just try and focus in on the storm because big counties like Weld County and Larimer County, if we issued a tornado warning for the whole county, we'd scare a lot of people when the storm is only in one smaller area. And Colorado's on the western edge of what we call Tornado Alley, uh, the central part of the country. It's very easy for warm, moist air to flow up from the Gulf of Mexico, cool, dry air to come down from the plains of northern and central Canada, warm, dry air to come off of the plateau, the higher elevations in Arizona and New Mexico. And that creates the, the ingredients to cook up tornadoes. And that's why we see so many of them in that part of the country, including eastern Colorado. Now, the biggest, baddest thunderstorms we call supercell thunderstorms. They create large hail and tornadoes. They're rotating because of strong jet stream winds, and we can get a hook echo, which you see in the lower right. The Doppler radar can show us the kind of things we look for where we're seeing the motion in the storm. And so these are the ones that we really have to pay attention to. There are some of them that are called LP supercells, which stands for low precipitation. They don't have a lot of moisture uh, down at the ground level, so they're very dramatic. And that's why a lot of storm chasers love to chase in Colorado because they're just such amazing storms. The HP supercells are the very dangerous ones because they're producing lots of heavy precipitation and large hail. And you don't always see the tornado inside of an HP supercell. So storm chasers are really cautious around those. And here's a little joke. Anybody that watched the old Andy Griffith show, there's a supercell HP thunderstorm producing a tornado right near Otis. Wow, 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 wow. We'll be here all week. Now, another thing that happens very often in Colorado is we get thunderstorms scattered across all sorts of the eastern plains, and they produce outflows. In other words, gusty winds that develop, and we can actually predict new thunderstorms are going to form because these outflow boundaries of, of cooler, moist air will run into each other, and then that air is forced to rise, and you develop a new thunderstorm. And within that, you can also develop what we call land spout tornadoes, which are swirling uh, surface level winds that are drawn up into the developing thunderstorm. And of course, lightning's a major hazard, travels about five seconds per mile. So if you see the flash, start to count one, two, three, four, five. And, and if you hear the thunder, it's one mile away. If you count to 10, it's two miles away. Let's talk quickly about El Nino. Uh, that's warm water in the waters of the Pacific Ocean. It, the energy it puts into the atmosphere changes the pattern of the jet stream and we tend to get a lot of storms coming into the southwestern part of the country and dump a lot of heavy snow in Colorado. This year we have a La Nina that's cooler water that also changes the location of thunderstorms near the equator and changes the jet stream so that it favors more of the northern part of the state and that's what we see this year. Uh, slightly better chance of precip to the north and drier to the south and to the west. But long range forecasts are tough. So like this shirt that I wear, it says, well, it seemed like a good forecast at the time. We shall see. Here's some good weather sources you might write down. Um, opensnow.com is a really good resource in the wintertime for snow forecasts. WeatherTap, a great resource for radar. StormShield is the app that we uh, feature at Denver 7. Weather Call is a really good service, and Radar Scope is an excellent source to use for radar information. Let's talk quickly about climate change, all right? Everything else I've told you about the history of computers and how weather works in Colorado, that's just basically the way it is, and so it is with climate change. And because TV meteorologists are as close to scientists as most Americans get, we need to help educate our viewers. Sometimes people mistake weather and climate because Climate is what you expect and weather is what you get. Climate is a long-term average and weather is chaotic and it changes rapidly. You'd expect the climate of Miami to be warmer in February, but you could also go to Miami and you got a cold front down there and you happen to have a cold time. So it's actually easier to predict climate because climate is more of a general thing that we expect rather than the day-to-day -day changes in weather. And it's basic thermodynamics. If you add heat to something, it gets warmer. It's why day is warmer than night, summer is warmer than winter. 
So I like to say climate is the entire history of the NFL and weather is one play in a football game. And if it's snowing in Las Vegas, well, it's winter time and expect more unusual weather events. Global warmings create what we call a steroid effect, making droughts more extreme or floods stronger. So we know climate's always changed. Ice ages, continental drift, mass extinctions. We know the reasons why it changes, the changes in the Earth's orbit, changes in the sun, changes in atmospheric chemistry, and only the chemistry is changing fast. Right now at about 413 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the air, the highest in 800,000 years. And we can identify the special chemical signature to know that it's from burning coal, oil, and natural gas. And even though we've only had records going back 150 years, we are smarter than that. We use core samples and ice traps ancient air. And that's what a lot of the scientists at NCAR do to study what temperatures were like a long, long time ago. And this isn't new science. Way back in the 1800s, scientists knew that carbon dioxide was a major force trapping heat, making the earth warmer. And again, young ladies, Eunice Foote was one of the first female American scientists. And way back in 1856, she placed different jars of gas, oxygen, nitrogen, and carbon dioxide, and checked the temperature, and the carbon dioxide warmed up first. Hugo Eunice. And it's not political. Without the greenhouse effect, the Earth would be about 60 degrees colder. But it's too much of a good thing. Each doubling of carbon dioxide increases the energy that's trapped in the planet by about the same as a night light or an old fashioned Christmas tree bulb over the entire surface of the earth. That's a huge amount of heat and it's forcing the planet to get warmer and warmer uh, and forcing the ice to melt. Summers are getting hotter, snowpack is gradually getting less and we're gonna have water supply problems. Now, weather is still gonna be weather. We'll have snowstorms just like we always did. We'll cover them differently. I love the, the headlines here back in, 1913, Denver, milady of the snows, jauntily doffs her graying mantle and smiles. And in March 2003, snow and wind wallop the state. So we certainly have changed the way we write text. A warming world does mean that we can expect droughts and wildfires and floods to become more and frequent and more extreme. And we've certainly seen that this year. But there are things we'll be able to do moving forward that uh, we can try and mitigate the impacts with better planning. And that's what we're gonna to have to do and what our, our leaders are gonna help us to do. And hopefully boys and girls, things that you are gonna help do as well as we move farther into the future. So these are all important parts of what you can help us do as you learn better science. And the other major producers of carbon dioxide are working to improve their air quality as well. And did you know that in the third world, Kerosene lamps are very expensive and dirty and the kids get asthma and other breathing problems. Put a solar powered light in there and you can change their world. And we're doing it at Channel 7 at my house as well. We have solar panels on our building and on our roof here and I drive an electric car. And of course those renewable energy jobs are good jobs and they're high paying jobs and many of them are right here in Colorado. So we're seeing that we can change the world you know, you look at the change that have happened, how computers were back when I was a little kid, and they filled a whole room, and now we hold them in the palm of our hand. So these are changes that are going to be made, and it can happen fast. In 1900, on Fifth Avenue in New York City, in that one picture, there was one car. Everything else was horse and buggies. 13 years later, all cars, one horse and buggy. So I'm going to finish this part by just a couple of quotes from Albert Einstein, the significant problems we face cannot be solved at the same level of thinking when we created them. When it's asked how much it'll cost to protect the environment, one more question should be asked, what will it cost our civilization if we do not? Gaylord Nelson. And from John F. Kennedy, today our concern must be with the future, for the world is changing, the old era is ending, and the old ways will not do. John F. Kennedy in 1960, we stand today on the edge of a new frontier, a frontier of unknown opportunities and perils. It would be easier to shrink back from that frontier, but times demand new invention, innovation, imagination, and decision. Our problems are man-made, therefore they can be solved by man. No problem of human destiny is beyond human beings. And we've done it before. The railroads, the interstate, plumbing, the Manhattan Project, all of these things didn't bankrupt our country, but
but it made us better and we're thankful we have them today. And we're doing it now as we change over to renewable energy and battery storage. This is all happening big time out in California, but also right here in Colorado. We're going to try and put in a direct current grid to rapidly and efficiently move that energy, wind and solar around the country. These are things, boys and girls, are going to happen in your lifetime and change how we do things. We've done it before. We can do it again. In the bottom of uh, NCAR's basement is the Cray-1 supercomputer. The phones we carry is 30 times more powerful than that computer. And so these are the young people that are going to change the world as we move forward. And those are my grandchildren. And we are going to help to make sure this is a great world for them and for all of you. All right. So now I think it's time for me to do the tornado dance. So am I doing this right, Tiffany? I, I believe I so. I can't wait to see okay. it. All right, are we ready? Let's go. Okay, so boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, what we're gonna talk about here is how tornadoes form. So I'll just move this up just slightly. All right, so um, first of all, let's just pretend a couple of things. First of all, it's a really hot day, just hot and humid conditions. What we have when it's really hot like that is a great big bubble of hot air that's parked itself on top of Colorado, a great big hot air mass. Now let's also pretend that Denver and Boulder are down at my feet in miniature, little tiny Denver and Boulder. So got this great big bubble of hot air that's sitting on top of it. And everybody down below is hot and sweaty and miserable and uncomfortable. And the big blob of hot air is very, very happy about it. The hot air is up here going, man, this is great. I'm a big blob of hot air. And I love floating over Denver and Boulder and making everybody sweaty and miserable. I'm never leaving. Meanwhile, let's pretend we're up in Canada. So if we're up in Canada and we're air, we're going to be different than the air that's down over Denver because we're farther north, farther away from the equator, closer to the North Pole, and we get less heat from the sun. So the cool air is up there, and the cool air is like, man, I am so tired of being stuck up here in Canada. I'm going to cruise on down to Denver and cool everybody off. So the cool air leaves Canada and starts cruising on down toward Colorado. The cool air is walking in with its cool, and the cool air goes, hey, hot air, why don't you clear out of there? I'm coming in to cool everybody off. Well, the hot air is not going to take that line down. The hot air comes back and goes, no way, man. Get lost. Go back to Canada. I like it here. I'm not leaving. And so the cool air says, oh, yeah, I didn't travel all the way from Canada to come down here and chicken out and go back. And the cool air starts pushing on the hot air to get out of the way. Hot air's getting pushed around. Doesn't like that too well. So, boom, the hot air throws an elbow at the cool air. Cool air catches the elbow, knocks him backwards like this. Cool air won't take that line down. Cool air comes back, gives a bigger shove to the hot air. Hot air gives a big shove to the cool air. And pretty soon these two air masses are really going at it. Big shoving match going on. Well, that causes big thunderstorms to build above that shoving match. And those big thunderstorms tower way up into the sky, up thousands of feet into the air, where they reach the jet stream. Strong winds up at about 25 to 30,000 feet. Well, once that air gets up there and the jet stream goes by, the whole thing starts to turn a little bit. And this thunderstorm starts out big and slow, but then like a figure skater pulling it smaller and faster and faster and smaller. And that rotation begins to drop down through the cloud all the way down to the ground to form the tornado. So let's do the whole thing real fast. We start hot air floating over us like this. Everybody down below is hot, sweaty, and miserable. Meanwhile, up here in Canada, cool air starts cruising on down. Cool us off like this. Cool air says, hey, hot air, why don't you clear on out? Hot air's like this, saying, no way, man. Get lost. Go back to Canada. Cool air won't take no for an answer. Starts pushing on the hot air. Hot air doesn't like that too well, so boom, throws the elbow. Cool air gets knocked backwards. Cool air comes back with a bigger shove. Hot air, bigger shove. Pretty soon, the two air masses really going at it. Big thunderstorms build above the air masses. The air in the thunderstorm goes up like smoke through a chimney, but if the jet streams around, zoom, whole thing starts to spin big and slow at first then smaller faster faster smaller and that rotation drops down to the ground to form the tornado and that is the tornado dance let me get my earphones back on here so i can hear you that was something else well thank you <laughs> i've never even seen a real tornado but that's about as close as i've gotten i think okay I think my earbuds <laughs> might have died out, but I can't hope you can still hear me. I'm a little muffled. Okay. I can still hear you just All fine. Right. And in fact, we've got just a couple of minutes. We're, we're running a little bit over time, um, okay. but we've got some questions sure. and uh, we'll take just 
a couple minutes to read a couple of these questions and let you answer. First, Paul just says, great presentation and thank you for sharing the history. Grew up watching Bill Custer and Stormy. Thank you, Paul. Bill and Stormy are two <laughs> great friends and, uh, and two uh, uh, wonderful, wonderful people. Uh, um, I'm going to... Oh, go ahead. Sorry. I can just knock some of these out as I'm reading them here. Uh, why are morning tornadoes rare? We don't have the big heating of the day until mid to late afternoon. And the one thing that uh, we had to go over kind of quickly, um, the, the drier air that comes in off of the plateau in Arizona, New Mexico, that's what we call the cap because it's kind of up at about 15, 20,000 feet. It's warmer up there. And so during the morning hours, as the surface is trying to warm up, uh, that air can't rise because the cap is still warmer. And if you ever hear like the cap is breaking when storm chasers are talking about that, when it finally gets hot enough down here that busts through the cap, then the colder air, it's almost like if you take a bottle of soda with your thumb on the end and do that and just shooting up. So afternoons are the prime time for us to get tornadoes. I've never been in a tornado, uh, but I've seen a couple, but uh, most of the time I've been in studio, I don't get a chance to chase very much, but do not chase unless you take a course on proper ways to do it because uh, it, just don't grab your cell phone and go out there and try and chase a tornado. Okay. Um, how much inches of snow does Colorado get a lot? Well, in the Denver Boulder area, it's between about 60 and 90 a year on average, but you get up into the park range towards Steamboat and they get about 400 inches of snow a year. So the mountains capture most of the moisture and that's where we get the brunt, uh, the bulk of our moisture that we use for drinking and recreation. Everything is from snow melt as far as instead of summer precipitation. Worst storm I've ever been in myself, a couple of ice storms in the Midwest, uh, certainly the blizzards uh, back in uh, 87 and 2003 here, and of course the terrible floods back in 2013. I wasn't actually in it, but certainly was reporting about it. Why does Colorado get so much hail? We're a little higher, so we're a little co higher, closer to the cold air loft, plus uh, we get a lot of thunderstorm activity that develops every single day along the front range. And so there's a lot of strong thunderstorms that tend to form here, partly because of the terrain that we have here. And uh, the, the other part of it is that because our surface temperatures are a little bit lower than they would be, say, in the southern plains and stuff, they have hail up in the clouds up there, but it melts generally before it gets down to the ground. But this whole front range, Wyoming, Montana, Colorado, New Mexico, big time hail places. Uh, augmented reality technology for future weather forecasts, absolutely. Um, they're doing some of that stuff now where you can actually uh, have sort of uh, a graphic that you're standing in the middle of now. And uh, some uh, weather channel is doing a fair amount of that stuff right now. We may do some of that uh, uh, in the future. Uh, but of course, this is my home weather station right here. This is where I'm working right now. In the that's my whole area here at home. Till COVID's over, I don't think I'll have the technology of augmented reality in my basement. Uh, fastest speed ever known for a uh, tornado. Well, the, the EF5s have wind speeds. They're going to be around 250 miles per hour. It's sometimes a little tough to know because, of course, obviously the wind measure equipment blows away. But um, uh, there is, uh, you know, that's about where we're at. Hey, real quick, I wanted to point out. Um, I have a new book that's out, and this is available from Amazon.com. It's called The World's Littlest Book on Climate, uh, and it is designed to be a quick read. We're talking maybe 15 minutes or so. We say 10 minutes, but if you want to take a couple of notes. Uh, if you want to learn more about climate change in a simple, easy to understand format, uh, this book is now available, and you can order it directly from Amazon.com. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. I actually didn't know that you wrote a book, so I'll be going to Amazon and getting one of those right after this. That's There's always cool. more to learn, right? Absolutely. And uh, wrote it in conjunction with uh, Peter Tons up at NCAR. And so uh, uh, we just want to explain to people uh, that don't have enough time to read a full long textbook about climate change would we'll give you just key concepts of not only why it's happening, how it's happening, but the things we can do to uh, you know, have a better future. That's great. Well, Mike, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been such an honor. And um, so it, that was such a brief but extensive kind of trip through the history of meteorology. For all <laughs> of us weather fans out there, it's been really great. And I will say for anybody who's watching now, we're going to take a lunch break until 1230. 
But you weather fans hang on because the demonstration happening at 1230, as well as the one following it at one, we're going to be exploring a little bit more about weather and about the formation of clouds and hot air and cold air and how they act. So if you like this one, come back and join us in a little while. And thanks again, Mike. My pleasure. Bye, everybody. Have a great day. Bye-bye. See you soon, everybody.